Policy Exchange. My name is Dean Godson, Director. Great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, very important keynote address by Secretary of State for International Trade and President of the Board of Trade, Liz Truss, MP. Delighted to be able to welcome you all for the first time back to a live audience as well, though this is in fact a hybrid event and the uh, large size of the uh, online audience, both for and also the qualitative aspects of the audience, indication of what important uh, address this is. Many of you will have uh, read the accounts that have been in newspapers in advance of this, but uh, much more uh, to be said on the theme of uh, strategic trade, competition, and the importance of the UK in the post-Brexit era seizing uh, the initiative in respect of uh, selling to the burgeoning global middle class, nobody has been more at the heart of uh, expounding that vision than Liz Truss. We're delighted to be able to welcome her back today. She'll answer uh, questions afterwards. As I say, usual house rules, no question too outrageous. You just have to state your name and organization first. If I can also ask the online audience if they'd be so kind as to put their electron, electronic hands up. My apologies in light of the big demand, obviously, for this event, if anyone should be uh, disappointed, but we'll be glad to pass on your questions to the uh, Department for International Trade team. So thank you for coming today. Look forward to hearing what you have to say and uh, always welcome on our platform. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Dean. It's fantastic to be here this afternoon at Policy Exchange uh, to talk about trade and to talk about Britain's future as an open, enterprising economy where everybody shares the benefits of trade. And in order to recover from COVID, we need to make sure that we have thriving businesses who are seizing the opportunities of the future and creating jobs. At the Department of Trade, we are determined to make sure that we enable those opportunities. That's why we're building more successful trade routes, especially in digital and services. We're driving an exports-led recovery, and we're bringing investment to every part of the UK. Our trade strategy is grounded in the fundamental trade changes happening across the world. Namely, that we are seeing a growth in the world's middle class, and two thirds of the world's middle class will be in Asia by 2030. Secondly, that we know that digital trade is becoming the dominant form of trade. And finally, we can see a huge rise in demand for the kind of high value industries that the UK excels in. We're expecting that to double over the next decade. And we face a choice as a country. Do we reach out to take forward those opportunities or do we stay in our comfort zone? But in order to get those opportunities, we do have to jettison some of our outdated assumptions and attitudes. Today, I'm going to explain how we need to move from defence to offence in trade. And by doing that, how we're going to benefit all parts of the UK and level up our country. Our strategy is to grow trade with the fastest growing parts of the world and to turbocharge trade, particularly in digital and services. This will help forge our future as a tech trade superpower. Our approach will keep prices competitive, it will help make our businesses more dynamic, and ultimately it will help the UK economy grow and it will help level up our country. Understandably, after nearly 50 years of being in the protectionist EU, we lost our trade muscle memory that we'd built up as a sovereign trading nation. But we've been building it back negotiating our own trade deals, defending our key industries, and getting out on the front foot. Some people in the Twitter sphere and beyond find this rather unsettling. But my view is now is the time that we need to dump the baggage of the previous debates and look forward to the future of trade, not the past. Many of these naysayers have thinly veiled vested interests to protect. They want the status quo rather than a dynamic future. But I think it's important to recognize there is no status quo that we can stick with. We've got a choice. Embrace these opportunities and dynamism or face decline. Time and time again, our entrepreneurs in Britain have succeeded by looking forwards and being dynamic. The incumbents who have taken their positions for granted have seen failure. 
barely a third of the companies who are now in the FTSE 100 were there when it was first established in 1984. Now, of course, in the wake of COVID, we have worked really hard across government to make sure we are bringing in the life-saving goods for our country. And there were issues with supply chains. But I'm afraid that has led to calls for autarky, people saying that we should produce everything from gloves to microchips here in the United Kingdom. And of course, we need to make sure we're not strategically dependent on fair weather friends. But cutting ourselves off from trade would be hugely damaging. The Labour Party have called for all UK government contracts not to be awarded to overseas businesses. There are some people here in Britain who've said that if goods are not produced exactly according to the way they're produced in Britain, we shouldn't be importing them. But we've got to look at the logical results of those types of attitude. It would mean British businesses losing out on overseas government contracts. It would mean British consumers paying higher prices in shops. And it would mean huge swathes of developing countries losing out on their potential to become more successful. There are other people who say that the impact and experience of COVID justifies a permanently bigger state. But what we know from our history of post-war Britain is it ultimately leads to worse outcomes for everyone. We saw poor productivity, we saw stagnant growth, and we fell behind our international competitors in those years following the war. Industries like steel and shipbuilding were let down by successive governments, which led to job losses and deindustrialization, a situation that we are now turning around. And it must never be forgotten that the reason that millions of people voted for us for the first time last year, or the year before, in 2019, the reason millions of people voted Conservative is because they wanted to see a new future. They wanted to see us as buccaneering champions of free enterprise. They wanted to see their areas succeed. They didn't believe the idea that they were in some kind of decline. They wanted to see products and services made in their areas sold around the world. And they wanted to see their communities, whether it was Bishop, Auckland, Lee, Workington, Wrexham, succeed. And that's why we must now face facts. The path to economic revival doesn't lie in retreating and retrenching from the global marketplace or inexorably growing the size of the state. That would leave us poorer, less free and consigned to decline. The Prime Minister is absolutely right that in order for us to win and succeed in 2024, we need to fully embrace free enterprise and free trade to deliver to voters the promises we made about the future of Britain. The trade agenda is crucial to that and it's an often underrated part of our economic arsenal. For all those reasons and more, our best way forward is free trade and free enterprise. And I'm pleased to say that people across Britain increasingly agree. Two in three surveyed last year supported free trade. Our most recent survey taken this year shows that support has risen. It has hit 70% of the public supporting free trade. And it's clear that the British people support our strategy to move from defence to offence. This strategy is crucial for our success. As we expand our trade footprint across the globe, we were negotiating right through the pandemic, striking advanced trade deals whilst championing open markets and free enterprise. Our strategy is grounded in the fundamental principle of securing more trade and particularly expanding trade with fast growing parts of the world. This is the way that we are going to get the best deal for everyone. And it's how we'll cement Britain's place as a global hub for trade and investment. We want to be open to the best and the brightest. We want to attract the world's top investors. We struck deals so far covering 68 countries plus the EU, worth 744 billion pounds. We're in negotiations now to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is one of the world's largest free trade areas. By the end of 2022, we're just about to commence negotiations with India, Mexico, Canada and the Gulf. We've established the Office for Investment under Lord Grimston, 
and we're going to be holding the UK's first Global Investment Summit in October, and it will involve a reception at Windsor Castle with Her Majesty the Queen. We'll also be pursuing green investment through the COP26 Summit. We're a science and tech superpower, as demonstrated by our world-leading vaccine rollout, our fantastic technology industries, our great universities. And we're also pursuing radical regulatory reform in areas from gene editing to financial services and right across the board in technology. We want to make sure that the United Kingdom is more competitive, bolder and more forward-leaning than any other country on the planet. And we're supporting our, our exporters and investors through trade and investment hubs right across our country. So why are we doing all this? Well, it's pretty much for the same reason that Robert Peel abolished the protectionist corn laws. It's about answering what he called the great question. What is calculated to increase the comforts and improve the condition for working people? Peel's reforms marked a new era of prosperity. GDP tripled by the end of the 19th century. And what we face now is we face significant economic challenges as we recover from the pandemic. Inflation is rising globally with commodity prices soaring, which heightens the need to keep prices down for consumers. Across the world, we see disrupted supply chains, labor shortages and cost rising. Trade has a vital role to play in keeping prices down. Research published by the National Bureau of Economic Research estimates the average British consumer would lose a third of their net income in real terms without trade. And it's even worse for the poorest 10% of our society. Their net income would be cut in half. That's because those on the lowest incomes spend a greater share of their money on imported goods like food and clothing. Protectionism is no way to protect people's living standards. At this critical time, we need to trade to curb any rise in the cost of living through the power of economic openness. And by extending and deepening our trade routes, we can buy more of what we need at competitive prices. We're also broadening our range of reliable suppliers. That's, all, that's what the Trans-Pacific Partnership is all about. We currently import 28 billion pounds of goods from those areas, but by joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we can do it on reliable terms. They have high labor standards, high environmental standards baked into the deal, so we get more reliable supply. And the stronger the trade routes we establish, the more British employers can benefit from exchanging their products, innovation and capital. As the OECD makes clear, trade openness is really crucial to success. We've seen how countries have transformed their fortunes. So New Zealand, a nation of 4 million people, now produces enough food to feed 40 million, thanks to its open approach to trade. It's the second largest dairy exporter in the world. By contrast, other countries like Malaysia and Mexico that pursued protectionist policies found themselves struggling to compete. They've now embraced the Trans-Pacific Partnership and are seeing economic growth as a result. I'm determined that in the United Kingdom, we learn those lessons. We learn the lessons from our overseas counterparts and from our own history. And at this critical moment, we make the right choice. Rejecting protectionism and statism, and instead embracing enterprise and free trade. And in doing so, making people better off, particularly those in the lowest incomes, particularly those outside London and the Southeast. And I'm determined to make sure that this industrial success is shared across the country. We want to involve business in negotiating those agreements, as well as encouraging them to export and invest in Britain. In the past, we've made mistakes. We focused too much on trade with the EU, despite the richest opportunities being in the Asia Pacific. We were too fragmented in our support and not focused enough on exporters right around the country. Over half the money that we spent on our trade shows previously went to businesses around London. But now our new trade show program is going to focus on the whole country, helping firms across the Midlands, North and other parts of the UK. Nearly half of the businesses UK Export Finance supported were also in London and the South East. But now we have the new UKEF General Exporting Facility. 
It's targeting business from Aberdeen to the West Midlands, making sure that everyone benefits from the backing of the UK government. We're also launching a new export strategy later this year that will support jobs and levelling up our country by creating a single export support service. And we'll extend its reach through our hubs in Darlington, Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast. The next step is going to be fully digitising our trade. So Singapore is a, is a model for this. It has the world's largest transshipment port. It has a single window at the border. We want that here in the United Kingdom. And why is all this important? It's important because we know that exporters pay higher wages, they're more productive, they do more research and development. But exporting businesses are far more likely to be found in London than they are in Sunderland or Glasgow. That's why we want to level up the country by making exporting the norm rather than the exception. I want Britain to become a nation of exporters again. And it's not insurmountable. We did export 600 billion of goods and services last year. But only one in 10 British businesses export. In Germany and Denmark, twice as many businesses export per capita. And businesses in Slovenia are three times more likely to export their goods. There's no reason we can't match them. My message to business is clear. We are out there negotiating trade deals. We want to help you walk through those doors access those opportunities. Our agenda is about unleashing Britain's full export potential. And I want to see more goods that are made in Britain sold across the world. We together can lead a huge exporting revival. Ultimately, more British businesses becoming high wage, high growth and high productivity will help drive our future economic success. And we're going to make that happen by focusing on the areas where we have comparative advantage. Services, science and technology, culture, advanced manufacturing, quality food and drink. Today I'm publishing new analysis by the Department of International Trade, which sets out the potential price in the global market. And it lays bare two major trends. Firstly, the centre of gravity of the global economy is moving east. Almost 60% of the world's high income earners are set to be in Asia by 2030. And this means more consumers who want to buy the kind of products Britain sells, whether it's technology, financial services, or high quality manufactured goods. Secondly, we're seeing an accelerated adoption of technology, particularly after COVID. Demand for digital services is set to double in this decade. And we're also seeing demand booming for all of the types of industry Britain specialises in, from life sciences to the media, in a global market that could be worth over nine trillion by 2030. We're going to make the opportunities work for us and we're going to take advantage of them as a newly nimble nation. We're using our first mover advantage to the utmost. For example, we started negotiating with Australia a year ago and we've already secured agreements. And we're achieving quality at speed by building a network of next generation trade deals that are advanced in services and digital trade where Britain excels. We're forging modern trade routes, taking us from Silk Road to Silicon Road. And we're playing to our strengths as the world's second largest services exporter. And for me, the world's most innovative economy. While some say that we should stay on the defensive, and focus on what we could lose. We are on the offensive. We're zeroing in on where the biggest opportunities are to make our country successful. Now, of course, we will continue to protect our industries against unfair practices and malign actors. We've shown that we're prepared to operate in trade defense as well. But we know fundamentally that offense is the best form of defense. By taking this approach, we're helping export British goods and services and driving up productivity and wages. At the same time, we're defending our core beliefs in free enterprise, free speech and democracy. I know that the British people are up for the journey ahead. They want to see us out in the global market, on the front foot, competing and succeeding. They're ready to join us, seizing the opportunities of the future. Together, we're moving to offence to cement our status as an open, enterprising economy 
which shares the benefits of trade with everyone. And that's helping us level up our country with new opportunities, new jobs and new growth. And by doing so, we're answering Peel's great, great question about how to best improve the lives of people across our country. That answer remains true as ever, free enterprise and free trade. Thank you. Do you mind if I come round the other side? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Do I see any questions? Just trying to get a flavour <laughs> from the room. Gentleman there, name and organisation, please. Good afternoon, James Landale, BBC. Uh, two questions, please. One is, when do you expect to agree a trade deal with the United States? Uh, and secondly, what's your policy on China? Where do you draw the line between human rights and trade? Thank you. Well, on the, on the United States, we've already had success in de-escalating the Airbus Boeing uh, tariff war, which has now led to a working group on large civil aircraft and we've got the tariffs removed on products like whiskey uh, which was very important for our industries uh, we are working together with the united states on how we defend key industries against unfair practices such as steel uh, and other traditional industries as well as looking at how we work together in areas like technology i was pleased to see last night that the u.s has appointed their chief agricultural negotiator uh, so they now have their full negotiating team up and running. And of course, the United Kingdom are absolutely ready to negotiate when the United States are. But we have lots of opportunities on the go, as you can see from the list I outlined, the CPTPP, India, the Gulf. So we're, we're, we're using all our negotiating capacity, but of course the US is a big opportunity when they are ready to negotiate. Thank you. I see. And China. So China is, of course, and you will see this from our global trade outlook, a very important trading partner for the UK. And what I want to make sure is that trade with China is reliable, it's stable, and it's done in accordance with the international rules. And we're having direct discussions with the Chinese on that, but we're also working with like-minded allies uh, to do things like challenge unfair industrial subsidy, forced technology transfer, and IP violation. And I talked earlier about how important it is that the trade we do underpins our values of free enterprise and democracy. And what we can't have is those values being undermined by trade we do. So trade with China is important. We want to make sure it's reliable, but we don't want to become strategically dependent on China. I see an electronic question. I see from uh, TV New Zealand. Can you state, can you hear me? Yes, I can. You can hear me? Loud and clear, yes. Yeah, could you ask your question, please, for Secretary of State? Thank you, State Secretary. Daniel Faitawa from Television New Zealand. Uh, as you're aware, negotiators with New Zealand seem to have locked horns. What is the holdup, and can you please be specific? And just to follow up, how confident are you of securing a deal by the end of the year with New Zealand? Thank you. So I'm very, I'm very confident we will secure a, new, a deal with New Zealand. Talks are going very well with New Zealand. Of course, you will expect me to be representing British interests in those negotiations, which I absolutely am. And it's important we get the right deal uh, rather than feel the pressure of time. But there are no uh, substantive issues that we can't deal with, and I'm confident uh, we'll secure those negotiations pretty soon. But as you can imagine, Daniel, I'm not going to go into the details of the negotiation live on New Zealand television. Just see. Gentleman there in the middle. In by the yeah. Exactly. Name and organization, please. Hi, uh, um, my name's Emilio. I work for Politico. Um, a cynic would say that the UK is not really ready to go on the offensive with trade. As Emily Thornbury said, we haven't actually finished one single new trade deal since we left the EU. Um, like you were just being asked about the US deals kind of in the deep freeze. India probably won't be an FTA, it'll be lots of small deals, people in the Department of Trade tell me. Our efforts to encourage other people to raise standards aren't going very well. For example, we just had to drop our environmental demands on Australia to get a deal with them. Uh, and today you're basically just re-announcing our existing ambitions, right? India and CPTPP and Asia and the Gulf. 
So what makes you think that Britain is ready to go on the offensive? And then as a second question, uh, just want to get your thoughts on, um, yeah, dropping those demands on Australia. Why did we do that? Surely it was an opportunity to make sure that Australia signs up to specific climate commitments ahead of COP. Well, Emilio, I'm old enough to remember when people said the UK wouldn't be able to negotiate any trade deals, that we didn't have the trade negotiation capacity, that we couldn't get as good deals as the EU. And in fact, we succeeded in achieving virtually all of those deals on time. And in the case of Japan, we were able to go further and faster than the EU in areas like digital and data and mobility. We've got to agreement in principle uh, with Australia. That took us under one year. I believe the EU are still in negotiations with Australia after four years. So I think we're making very good progress. The second accusation, of course, following the Australia deal was we were moving too fast and we were in a hurry uh, to secure all these deals. And now the latest thing seems to be we're not fast enough. But I would say we're a bit like Goldilocks. Uh, we're doing it just at the right speed to secure the full UK interest, particularly in areas like digital and services that are so important to our economy, whilst remaining nimble uh, so we are able to access these opportunities as soon as possible. Uh, just to be clear, the India deal will be a fully comprehensive deal. Uh, I had a very good discussion with Priyash Goyal, my counterpart yesterday. He's very clear on our, I'm very clear on that. I don't know who you've been speaking to, Emilio, uh, but they, I don't think they're involved in the negotiations. And yet, as for this issue uh, on Australia and the environment, Australia has committed for the first time in any trade agreement a clause on climate change. And both parties have reaffirmed their commitment to Paris, which is what we agreed at AIP and what will be in the final deal. So uh, the stuff you're repeating is simply fake news uh, about that. Uh, but let me just bro more broadly address the issue of climate change. Fundamentally, the best way to address climate change is to get agreement for all countries to achieve net zero targets at COP. It's not through trade agreements, it's through the COP process that we look to do that. If that doesn't succeed, the second best option is for us to deal with carbon leakage at the World Trade Organization. So it's embedded globally. And if that doesn't succeed, of course, the UK could take action. But we wouldn't be taking action through individual free trade agreements. We'd be taking global action. If you think about it, our biggest import partner at the moment is China. So we would want to take action that was comprehensive. And what the Australia deal does is fully allows the UK, which is right, its sovereignty and right to regulate. Uh, so those are the important principles that we operate on. Thank you. Just get a flavour of Seawell's uh, wanting to ask questions. Gentleman towards the back. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, there have been reports, obviously. Name an during, organization, oh, please. Apologies, sorry. Louis Ashworth, The Telegraph. Um, there have been reports uh, during the process of negotiation on both Australia and New Zealand that you haven't been entirely aligned with some of your fellow cabinet members. Do you think that cabinet members uh, are agreed in what should be on offer in these trade deals? And do you wish that some of your colleagues in the cabinet would uh, offer more on certain fronts? Well, I'm, I'm not going to reveal in this room sort of internal cabinet discussions, but I think in the case of Australia, we've got to a very good agreement that benefits uh, both the UK and Australia. Trade is a win-win. It's about deepening trade routes between our nations. We're looking to do that on New Zealand. And there's huge support uh, across the cabinet for our future negotiations, whether it's with India, whether it's with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, whether it's with the United States. I see one or two uh, friends from Australia here. I don't know whether any of them wish to comment at this uh moment, but they're not catching the auctioneer's eyes, so, uh, so despite my it's probably provocation. probably a deliberate thing, is, I think, is, so it's, uh, Gentleman there, just name an organisation, please. Hi, uh, William James from Reuters. Um, you talked at the start about jettisoning old ideas. Um, it seemed like you're, you're talking to a particular audience there. I wondered if you could be more specific about what it is you think we need to jettison about the UK, UK trade strategy uh, and who you're aiming those comments at. We, we've spent 50 years in the EU, and it's natural that whether it's business, whether it's um, you know, people employed by the government, others, there are certain you know, 
there are certain ideas that have been sort of shared, promulgated, and you know, are still present in some quarters. I'm by no means saying it's universal, but there is still a, you know, in parts of the UK debate, I would say a defensiveness about trade. I think we have huge amounts to win from striking trade deals with other countries. I think if you look at you know, nations like Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, they've been successful through trade. And what I want to do is move from the defensive mindset, which says, what will we lose, to the offensive mindset of saying, here's what we can gain. And we're open to competing. And I think sometimes there can be a lack of self-belief. You know, take um, Britain's agriculture industry. I think we produce some of the best products in the world. There's huge demand for them. Everywhere I go, the British brand is associated with quality. People want more of it. So I want to see a bit more of the self-belief uh, here in Britain that others think of us when we, we go overseas. And you know, we were talking a bit earlier about the pipeline of trade negotiations. It, there are more countries on that list who want to negotiate with the UK when we have available negotiating capacity because they see the UK as a partner they can trust. Uh, they see our market as having huge opportunities, and they also see us as a, um, a country prepared to speak out for free trade at a time when there is growing protectionism. So I just think we shouldn't be hiding our light under a bushel, and I want to encourage people. So it's not in the spirit of admonishing at all. It's in the spirit of encouragement. Thank you. Alexander Downer, our Chairman of Trustees, distinguished former Foreign Minister of Australia. You sort of Warmwell. inspired me when you said the Australians weren't asking questions. So I actually <laughs> have a question not about the Australian FTA, which congratulations you've done in a year and it's an extraordinarily good achievement, but about the um, Trans-Pacific Partnership or the CPTPP as it's called. Um, given that there are 11 countries that already have already negotiated and concluded this agreement. Could you say something about how you approach the negotiations, given that um, as a late, ex a, a late accession to the agreement, you won't really be able fundamentally to change the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement that all of those 11 countries have made? Um, so, I mean, my point being that you don't have a lot of negotiating flexibility. You pretty much have to sign on to what is already mm. there. Well, the good thing is, Alexander, that we like uh, the contents of the Trade Pacific, Trans Pacific Partnership. It's been negotiated by a lot of our trade friends across the world who we happen to agree with. So, it's got a very good chapter on digital and data, it's very advanced on services, it's got strong environmental protections. It's got good labour standards. So the Trans-Pacific Partnership insists on a minimum wage. It insists on trade union uh, recognition in country as well. So these are all things that the UK can and will sign up to. Uh, but unlike the EU, it doesn't have the constraints on sovereignty. It doesn't have the requirement of harmonisation of laws. It doesn't have the requirement to pay in money. It doesn't have the requirement to give up control of your borders. So it's a, it's a very UK type of deal. Uh, so that is why we are very keen uh, to be part of it. But of course, there will be negotiations, including with uh, your own government. Uh, and in particular, we will need to negotiate market access with all 11 partners. Now, the Australia deal covers the market access negotiations for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, so that's done. Uh, but there are other nations that we'll need to negotiate with. And we're doing bilaterals with Canada and Mexico, which will also cover off uh, the CPTPP. So don't worry, we'll be keeping our negotiators busy, uh, probably through to uh, mid-late 2022 negotiating the CPTPP. But it is a great agreement. And I think the other really exciting thing about it is the fact that many other countries want to be part of it. So there is already Thailand are interested, the Philippines are interested, and who knows? Uh, which other major world players could be interested uh, in this high standards free trade agreement. Thank you and also a warm welcome to George Brandis, present High Commissioner of Australia, distinguished former Attorney General and also to the High Commissioners of uh, India and Bangladesh here today as well. Gentlemen there in the middle row, just further down, just name an organisation please. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, my name is Afsal Lamine. I'm the chief executive of a British company called London Expertise, and we work primarily in Central Asia. And you've spoken a lot about um, the big economies, Russia, uh, China, or not Russia, but China, India, and, and, and uh, Mexico, and so on. Uh, but there are lots of other smaller countries in between those big economies that often get neglected. And uh, we've been working for the last seven years, particularly in Kazakhstan, on exploration, mining, and uh, water infrastructure. And in that, we've had a huge help from UK Export Finance. So I want to say a very big thank you to you and your department for the excellent work that UKEF do. Uh, as we try and develop uh, the size of our uh, uh, business into far bigger uh, numbers and also much more economic integration across the Central Asian republics, is there any opportunity that the UKF premium can now be negotiated uh, if the volume of, 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 of the deal is big enough uh, now that we've left the EU and hopefully we don't have those sorts of constraints on us? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that um very, very specific question about, about UKEF. And UKEF has been a huge success. Its, its support for business has increased hugely uh, during the COVID crisis. It's, very, it's been a very important way of underwriting exports. And as I said, we're expanding its reach through the general um, export facility, which makes it much easier for small businesses to export, to export under it. Of course, we continually look at the premium. We look at the ways, uh, the ways UKF operate. I'm keen to see it operate in more sectors. Uh, so, for example, I think there's a big opportunity to, to increase export capital in areas like agriculture, um, and I think we should look at that. And you know, as for the list of trade deals we're negotiating, of course, we have to we have to start with the the places that are the greatest economic opportunity. As I've said, I think the exciting thing about TPP is it's expandable. Uh, so there's every hope, provided countries are able to reach the standards, that they can actually join uh, the TPP, not requiring a separate negotiation uh, with the UK. But of course, when we're, when we're through the current pipeline, uh, who knows what new opportunities might be in store. Just trying to get a flavour of how many more, how many. I can take one more from the online for the moment. Brett Williams of Williams Trade Law. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Thank you. Your question, please. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very impressive speech. Uh, one of the consequences of no longer being in the EU is that the UK will no longer have to agree with the EU when it makes proposals on negotiations in the WTO. Can we expect some uh, ambitious and innovative uh, liberalisation proposals from the UK in the WTO that get away from the things that have been, uh, get away from the obstructions, I might say, that the EU have sometimes put in the way of negotiations in the past? So yes is the answer. Um, the, the WTO is in desperate need of reform. When it was established, uh, in 1995, the Chinese economy was a tenth the size of the US economy. Uh, I don't think we'd had the first climate change conference. I think Google was yet to open its website. So it hasn't adjusted to the modern day. And in order to get WTO reform, which requires unanimity, it is going to require every country involved to make compromises. And that includes the EU. Uh, so I do think the UK is a vo voice for reform. Uh, we are prepared to go out on the front foot. I'm very hopeful uh, that MC12 in uh, Geneva this November will move things forward. I think Dr Ngozi ha is a dynamic leader who's made a fantastic start at the job. So all power to her elbow. And I've been very clear with her, the UK is prepared to be flexible in order to get things done. Thank you. Just trying to get a flavour gentleman there in, yeah, towards the front in the by the name and organization please uh, afternoon secretary of state adam Payne from politics home um firstly following up from james's question earlier um are you confident that you'll sign a deal with the us before the next general election and secondly on the decision announced earlier to delay checks on eu imports again are you at all frustrated that this aspect of post-brexit life is continually being kicked down the road you kind of wish we'd just get on with it I cannot make promises about when I'm going to sign a trade deal with any country because essentially I give up negotiating leverage with that country. So I'm not going to make any predictions. 
all I will say is it made huge economic sense for the UK and the US to have a closer trading relationship. There are areas like digital and data where there are huge opportunities for us to work more closely together. I know uh, the US are looking at digital agreements and we're, we're in active discussions with them, but I'm not going to prejudge or give a deadline uh, for the concluding po point in any, in any negotiations. On the subject of import controls, we are still in a global pandemic. Supply chains have been hugely disrupted. Container shipping costs have been rising. Uh, air freight is very, very difficult. It's absolutely right to suspend those additional checks whilst we are dealing with a serious issue, which, by the way, isn't just the UK. It's an issue across Europe. It's an issue in North America. But we need to be as flexible as possible because what's important is being able to import uh, the goods and services that we need. And I, I talked earlier in my speech about the vital importance for people on low incomes of imports, particularly clothing and food. And it, it's very important that we don't uh, exacerbate disruptions by putting in extra controls at this stage. David Campbell-Bannerman, former MEP, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear now. Yeah. Your question, um, please. Um, yes, Secretary of State, um, Liz, <laughs> thanks for the brilliant job you've done and the DI team uh, on these trade deals around the world. You've actually overtaken the EU. I was an MEP on the International Trade Committee for 10 years and working on New Zealand and Australia, for example, and, and you're well ahead now. Um, and I look forward to joining the largest trade bloc in the world. That's uh, the CPTPP, not the EU. Um, may I just ask you, though, that I find businesses are not really thinking of exports. Um, and, you know, even uh, service companies aren't really understanding the benefits of like mutual recognition in trade deals, for example. And only 27% of our GDP is international trade at all, much lower than many, many countries. So. I just was going to ask, you know, how do we sell trade deals better and, and how do we encourage more to export? I know this is an area of great interest to you, but I think it's a real challenge and, uh, you know, I commend you for taking it on. Thank you. Well, thanks, David. I, I completely agree with you. We need more of a culture of exporting in this country. As I said, only one in 10 businesses in Britain export. There's huge potential uh, for us to do more. Uh, the recent opinion surveys we've conducted suggest that support for trade is rising, uh, support for trade deals is rising, interest is growing. But I talked earlier about trade muscle and how we'd lost trade muscle as a country. And it isn't just within the government apparatus, it's also within business. So many of the businesses I speak to are currently staffing up in areas like trade. They're getting more involved, they're getting more interested. We're seeing more re responses to our consultations, particularly in areas like services where there are huge amounts to gain. But it's a, it's a gradual build-up of capability. And quite often, when the trade debate is presented in public, it's like, this year, what are we going to get out of it? These, these trade agreements are very long-term. You know, they help set the terms of trade for decades to come. And what I'm really looking at is where are we in 2030? Where are we in 2040? Where are we in 2050? Where is the global economy then? How is Britain positioned in that global economy? And how are our businesses positioned? But I think businesses take, a, take time to make new investment decisions. They take time to build up their strategy. So it's, it's not surprising that you know, immediately after Brexit, they're not, not all businesses are fully engaged. But what we're seeing is increasing engagement. Uh, we're seeing increasing interest and we are as I've said, rolling out our operation across the UK so we can engage businesses on the ground. Thank you. If I take the last uh, question as a, a triple bill. Sorry, Alex, to make it. Gentleman there, gentleman there. Do I see anyone else? You just do it as a trio of three. It's uh, Joe Mays from Bloomberg. Just following up from Adam's question about the EU imports. So these are import controls that should have been brought in in January 2020 when Britain left the EU, and that was before the pandemic hit. There are now going to be 18 months where British exporters face the full panoply of customs checks into the EU, which is hurt trade, whilst EU imports will not have to face 
such checks. Today, the Food and Drink Federation said, the asymmetric nature of border controls facing exports and imports distorts the market and places many UK producers at a competitive disadvantage. What is incorrect with that assessment? Um, gentlemen, there, last question. Name an organisation, please. Thank you, David Lawrence, Trade Justice Movement. With COP26 this year in the UK hoping to be a global leader on in the fight against climate change, what's your assessment of the compatibility of the UK's membership of the Energy Charter Treaty, which enables fossil fuel firms to sue the UK government for passing climate-related regulations uh, with the UK's overall climate ambition? And can we expect any kind of review of membership of that treaty? Any last bid? Anyone else? Just one, two. Gentleman there. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, still Louis Ashworth from The Telegraph. Um, would you like to see a future in which our trade um, relations with the European Union are handled by DIT? And how long do you think it'll be before that's the case? <coughs> so on the, on the subject of import controls, of course, we, we did that in 2020 for reasons of pragmatism. And given that we are still seeing the fallout of supply issues as a result of a global pandemic. I think now would be the wrong time to put those controls in. Uh, and I think what we need to focus on is what is going to benefit uh, British consumers, British companies, many of whom rely on imports to produce their goods. Uh, so it's not just about uh, exporting companies, it's also about importing companies. And I think it's absolutely right, uh, the pragmatic approach that we are taking and you know, we want to see more pragmatism from the European Union, as we always do. Um, on the subject of um, COP26 and um, energy and climate change, it, fundamentally, free trade and free enterprise are the best way to deal with environmental issues because they help spread technology, they help spread ideas, and they help find the solutions that are going to tackle uh, climate change. And we've, we retain our full right to regulate, to make sure that we're not seeing carbon leakage out of this country, that we are able to uh, achieve our climate change targets. So I'm absolutely confident in all of the deals and negotiations we do that we retain that full right to regulate. Um, and on question three, I'm extremely happy with uh, Lord Frost and the excellent job he's doing. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you above all, Secretary of State, for choosing policy exchange, big strategic address, consequential remarks. Delighted to host them. Look forward to welcome you back. It will not be our last word on the subject and look forward to welcome you all back soon. Thank you again. Thank you.